Good evening, folks, and welcome to Son of Dell's Christmas Vlogmas Day 14. It is half past six on Monday. Um, it's been a bit of a quiet day today, but on the vlog today, we've got Harry Potter Funko Pop Advent Calendar. We've got, obviously, Nightmare Before Christmas Advent Calendar, and the guy that's in it, or the creature that's in it, is creepy as hell. And uh, we've got the Doggy Advent Calendar, of course. Uh, I've got a bit of a talk today about Liverpool Football Club which is very close to my heart and uh, something that happened today which he bought home to be honest um a poem and a bit of a talk about the theater industry a bit of everything really today uh, coming up the advent calendars Time for a treat, Jess. Mum's got to let the treat out first. Is it time for a treat, Jess? Mum's got to let the treat. Yeah. Let the treat. Yeah. Oh, what's this? Oh, what's this? What we got? What we got? What we got? What we got? What we got treat wise here? Oh, oh, there we got a lip. Oh! Oh, we've got the uh, two of them, Talking Doggy. Uh, Tommy! Uh, I want one! Uh, I want one! Uh, oh, good girl! <laughs> she juggled and flipped it up with the nose. <laughs> oh, was that nice? All gone. Move, she says. <laughs> Hello, folks, and welcome to day 14 on the uh, Nightmare Before Christmas Pocket Pop calendar. Yesterday was Jack as a snowman. One. I'd rather have them in the white bags because you can't tell who they are. I think if they're in the see-through bags, it kind of takes away a little bit of the fun, doesn't it? Let's see who we've got today. We have... What on earth is that? <laughs> Deb's looking... baffled as me. I have no idea what he's called. Quite disturbing actually. It looks like a... I don't know. Uh, and that is door 14 on the Nightmare Before Christmas advent calendar. So it's day 14 on the Harry Potter calendar as well. And yesterday it was Madame Maxime, played by the brilliant Francis de la Tour in the Harry Potter films. Oops. Go on then, Deb. Who's this? It looks like he's out of a 70s rock band. Oh, it's uh, Mr. F uh, the guy with the cat. The one, of the, one that roams the halls is a cat. Oh, scared. I forget his name. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like Slouch or something. He's called I'll say Filch. I'll say Filch. Filch. There's Filch. Yeah, Filch. That's him. 
That's Filch. It's Filch. And that is in door 14 of the Harry Potter Pocket Pop calendar, Filch. Yeah, so the Nightmare Before Christmas calendar was Dr. Finkelstein. I made him look creepy, didn't he, by showing his brain. I thought that was a nice thing to put in a Christmas advent calendar. But um, I looked on the internet, and the pictures I saw of him on the internet, he didn't have his brain showing, he just had a white front. But I don't know whether that's something to do with the film, I don't know. But I thought it was very creepy when I opened it, and I just saw this brain staring back at me. I thought, ooh, nice. And obviously, um, the Filch, and I didn't know the cat was called Mrs. Norris. I hadn't got a clue about that, but I knew he was called Filch. Because if you've ever played the Lego Harry Potter games, or the normal Harry Potter games on Xbox, PC, and PlayStation, whatever, you will notice that he is the one that you have to creep past in the... Uh, in the rooms and, and through the corridors without getting caught. And if his cat sees you, he comes after you and throws you back out and all sorts. So, yeah, I knew Filch was, definitely. Didn't know Mrs Norris, though. Now, today, uh, I haven't done a lot, to be honest with you. We've um, wrapped up some more Christmas presents, including the dogs. And a very strange thing happened today, actually. Normally, our dog doesn't care about Christmas, doesn't care about wrapping up presents, nothing like that. She doesn't want anything to do with it. Today, we couldn't stop her sniffing every parcel and wanting to know what was in everything we were wrapping. And she wouldn't leave us sides and she kept sniffing the air, thinking it was treat time. And she'd never done that before, so we were a bit we were a bit surprised, but pleased at the same time, because it means, hopefully, fingers crossed, she'll be a bit more involved on Christmas morning than she usually is. Because it usually involves us sitting there, and, and, and they're opening a present, like, for it, while she's there, and they're not being bothered, really. You know, she just, nah, if it's a new blanket, she'll lie on it, but other than that, she doesn't bother. Hopefully this year will be different. And uh, I've done a bit more on my mum's jigsaw that's behind me. I'll be doing a bit more of that tonight while my video's processing and stuff. And obviously yesterday, uh, I still haven't heard back off the delivery from yesterday, the home bargains delivery. But as you saw, if you watch yesterday's vlog, the, the disgusting state that the parcel arrived in was just something else. Uh, but I'm still waiting here back off them. Um, I didn't get me mystery Z box, uh, me uh, November Z box off uh, Zavi today, so it must be coming tomorrow. We had a couple of deliveries this morning, and we also had a, a drop-off from my sister and a pick-up from my sister, because she had to drop off a bottle of brandy and some Christmas presents for us, and pick up some Christmas presents for us. All done proper, social distance and all that, you know, parcel, you get it, right, I'll go to the door and all this sort of stuff. So that was all done proper. And the bottle of brandy, what it was is Deb makes her own Christmas cake, and she soaks the fruit in brandy. And because she's only doing one for us this year, um, it was easier to get the brandy quite late on. You know, we didn't need it start of the month or nothing like that. So, uh, yeah, I've got a brandy brandy soaked Christmas cake coming up. So that'll be nice. Now, today, I was um, very upset because the passing of somebody who means a lot uh, in Liverpool Football Club's history. And obviously, over the year, we've had some great managers. Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley, uh, even now, you know, Jurgen Klopp. But one of the managers that really turned around Liverpool's fortunes was Gerard Houllier, who passed away today, age 73. Now, I remember when Gerard Houllier came into Liverpool Football Club, we were kind of on a downslide. We were really, really playing bad football. Some games we played brilliant, but the majority of them we were dreadful, you know. And the, the players that we, we bought and, and sold in, the, in, in them six, seven years before he arrived were absolutely terrible. They'd started bringing through a couple of new academy players like Stephen Gerrard. Uh, he'd been playing for a couple of years by then, and so had Jamie Carragher. But when Gerard Houllier came in, he really turned Liverpool around. Um, 
he got us playing really good football, really progressive football. And I remember in 2001, we won the treble. We won the FA Cup. We won, I think it was called the Littlewoods Cup back then. And we also won the UEFA Cup as well, all in the same season and finished third in the Premier League. So we had a belting season. We really did. And it was all down to Gerard Houllier. And uh, I remember a certain incident when he took ill uh, uh, when we were, were playing the match and he had to go to hospital and he underwent heart surgery. And uh, it was touch and go as to whether he'd make it or not. But he did make it and he did a brilliant job at Liverpool. Unfortunately, things didn't quite go as planned and he ended up being replaced. But I thought for what he did in them four years, to win five trophies was just incredible. And uh, I think Liverpool Football Club owe him a massive debt because he started them believing that they could be the team they were in the 80s. It had been 20 years, but they could be that team again. They could dominate. They could be a team that people feared to play. And it was through that mentality that got us through the years that followed. You know, we won the Champions League. Uh, we won uh, FA Cups here and there and different things, but we never really dominated and obviously, once Jurgen Klopp come in, he turned Liverpool again. He, he he finished off the job really. He bought the players and he wanted. He got us playing brilliant football, attacking football. Teams couldn't handle us. I mean, last year we destroyed we destroyed teams a lot of the time. We didn't just beat them; we destroyed them, um, and we thoroughly deserved to win the league. But uh, I was really sad to read of his passing today, and he was only 73, and that's not very old, really, is it? I mean, you hear some people living to 96, 97, 98. Uh, he's had he's had bad uh, health problems for a very long time though, and uh, I watched a program not long ago uh, called Thirty Years of Hurt, and it was basically about Liverpool and how when they won the title in 1990, that was the last title they won until 2019-20, that you know last year like, and uh, watching that documentary, and they actually interviewed him, and you could tell he was still very passionate about Liverpool. Liverpool was a part of him and, all, and and stayed with him all the way to the end. And people like Jamie Carragher and that were absolutely devastated because Jamie Carragher was a really good friend of Gerard Houllier. And uh, I know a lot of footballers like Stephen Gerrard, uh, Danny Murphy, uh, Jamie Carragher, Jamie Redknapp, you know, they all basically got their Liverpool careers and their football in turn round because of Gerard Houllier. Um, he was just one of those managers that, he, he couldn't. They said he couldn't kick a ball in training. He couldn't even kick a ball straight. He, he was terrible at football. He really was. But as a tactician, and as, as, as somebody who could mastermind wins over teams and everything, he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. And I was really, really gutted when I woke up this morning, came downstairs, and he said I'd been tagged in a post, and I clicked on this post. It was my friend across the road who knows I'm a massive Liverpool fan. And when I saw it, my first thought was hoax, hoax, definitely a hoax. So I went on and checked. And I went on about six or seven different news sites and they all said the same thing. So I knew it wasn't a hoax. I was trying to convince myself it was a hoax. But uh, yeah, Liverpool FC and Gerard Houllier, you know, I mean, we had Rafa Benitez just after that. And we also had, we've had Roy Hodgson and we've had a few others. But I think, to be honest, he started, he started as believing that we could be a force in nature again. And that's exactly what we became, a force in football in nature. And bear in mind, after he left, it was only a couple of years, three years later, that we won the uh, Champions League when Rafa Benitez came in. And most of that was the team that was already there when Julio left. You know, it was it was the backbone was still there. Uh, so, yeah, we've got a lot to thank him for. Um, he was the one who put us on the right foot. Uh, so, yeah, RIP. Uh, Gerard Julio, who passed away today, age 73. Thoughts are with his family and everything at this t horrible time. I know what it's like to lose somebody like that because, like I said, my mum passed away uh, in August and she was only 71, so... Uh, I've just read today um, something that's hit Deb quite hard because Deb is... I don't know whether I've told you this before, but Deb is mad on the theatre. She's mad on the West End. She's mad on... Andrew Lloyd Webber is literally a hero. 
you know, he's God to her. And there's a last called Carrie Hope Fletcher, who's in quite a lot of Andrew Lloyd Webber stuff, and she loves her as well. Brilliant, no problem. And she watches a lot of stuff to do with them. She's she, she's been in musicals herself. She used to be a bit of a musical singer when she was younger as well. And her favourite ones are things like Cats and Les Miserables and Phantom of the Opera and all this sort of stuff. I don't like it, don't get me wrong, it's not my cup of tea, but she loves it. Now today, uh, Matt Hancock announced that London was going to go into Tier 3 lockdown which unfortunately is like a death knell to the um, theatre and the entertainment industry because for the last couple of weeks they've been able to start things back up again and, and, and get things running in the theatre industry and now they've got completely shut uh, so performances are going to stop and all that and I think to myself it's a waste because when I grew up in the 80s this, this country, believe it or not, was a hive of industry uh, late 70s early 80s Maggie Thatcher changed all that but that's totally different but we were a hive of industry literally we anything anybody wanted they bought it from the UK we were literally shipping out all sorts we did his own porcelain and everything we had pot banks in Stoke we had Sheffield uh, steel from the Sheffield works and everything we really were a hive of industry and all of it was killed off by foreign imports and we were buying stuff from abroad but the one thing we always kept was the entertainment industry and our entertainment industry was second to none. It's famous all over the world. The theatre, the West End, our acting, you know, everything about the UK entertainment industry is massive. And I thought it would always be here. But I've got a feeling that this might just ring its death knell. I think it might be the end of the entertainment industry because I can't see how it's going to survive after another lockdown. Now, Andrew Lloyd Webber has already proved that you can safely, safely um, put on a theatre show, a live theatre show, and make sure that everybody's social distanced, make sure all the hygiene's taken care of, the doors are automatic so you don't even have to touch the handles, nothing like that. Everything's secure, everything is uh, sanitised. You, you know, you can't literally... They've been running for two weeks and not one case at all. But the government don't see that. All the government see is, oh... The R rate's gone up, so we'll close the entertainment industry. And I think that's a massive, massive mistake. I really do. I do think it's a really bad mistake because we, as people, need the entertainment industry to give us a bit of morale, give us a boost, give us something. And the entertainment industry, remember, isn't just actors and actresses. Because I know people will say, oh, well, actors get paid thousands anyway, blah, blah, blah. You're talking about Hollywood actors who get 10 million a film. I'm not talking about that sort of actor. I'm talking about the kind that, you know, do 12 hours a day rehearsals just to put on a West End stage show or a play or a concert or anything. You know, these are people who are genuine down to earth people and their crust, their bread, their, their daily money is basically from being on stage, which is a lot different being an actor in Hollywood. Trust me. You ask the actors and what their lifestyles like, and if any of them can say, "Oh, I've got a, I've got a twenty million pound mansion and, and and a swimming pool and all this," what do you do? Oh, uh, I do theatre work in in London. No, 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 no. Um, but then again, you've also got to think it's not just the actors. Um, the theatre is a massive, massive group of people. You know, you've got the lighting, you've got the uh, stage hands, you've got the dress, you know, the uh, costume people, you've got the people who do the lights, the electricians, the plumbers. They're all there. The paint design, you know, the, the uh, what do you call it? The ones who paint all the uh, backstage stuff, the uh, scenery. I can't think what they're called, but them. You've got them, you've got everything. You've got the cleaners, you've got the ushers, you've got the people on the, de you know, on the desks taking the te tickets and all this sort of thing. And all those people are literally having their livelihoods wiped out just because the government are putting London into tier three lockdown. And bear in mind, if you're on about the entertainment industry and the West End, you, obviously it's London. That's where the main massive theatre industry is in the UK. And it, it just seems ridiculous that they are quite willing to throw it away when a guy who's obviously the leading person in the UK on, on theatre, you know, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber is literally Mr. Theatre, Mr. Musicals, Mr. West End, he is literally all that. And he has proven that you do not, you know, you, you, they can run a stage show, a, a theatre completely safely without any chance of you getting COVID or, so to say, with only a minimal, minimal chance. So instead of listening to him and saying, 
yes, it is viable. They've just said, nah, we're all in lockdown. And I just think it's a terrible waste. And I think it's going to kick us in the arse. I really do. There's certain industries we can lose because we can go to other countries for it. But you can't lose the entertainment industry. You can't lose the West End. You can't lose the theatre. You just can't do it. It's just ridiculous. I think Matt Hancock needs to have a real big rethink about this because he is literally shutting the door on millions of jobs. Millions of them. It's got to be. Counting all the people that, like I say, they're associated with the theatre. There's millions of them. Even writers who write stage plays, you know. I mean, I'm a writer myself. So, technically, I am part of the creative industry because I write books. I write poetry. Even doing this now, doing vlogging, that's creative. Creativity. Can't believe it, honestly. I can't believe that they've just decided just like that. that nah, sorry, lockdown, tier three, bump, done. What a sad world. Anyway, um, I'm going to read enough. I'm going to read a poem now, um, and then I'll have a bit more of a talk. Now, this poem is um, one I wrote a while back called "The Diary." Now, just imagine you have seen somebody you're sitting alone on a bench. Uh, and you see them sitting there each day, two, three, four, five days in a row. And they're just sitting there on their own, staring off into oblivion. And you can't tell by looking at them exactly what they're thinking and how, how the mind's going. Um, and this is the thing about depression. Depression is um, something that can't be seen. You can't look at somebody and know they're depressed unless they're acting strange and, and you know doing something which... Um, signifies the depressed if you like but I could just be sitting here now staring at the screen and you wouldn't know the depth of my depression now the diary deals with what can happen when the depression gets so bad so it might be safe to give you a little bit of a warning this is not a, a really user-friendly poem so if you don't want to listen to it skip through it now it's called the diary first entry it reads not much happened today I am lonely and sad, and I think that's how I will stay. I want you to be loved, that's all I ask. Is that too great a wish? Too bold a task? Won't someone see me, the person inside? Dear diary, you're wet now, I'm sorry I cried. Second day, what happens now, where do I go? I feel so depressed, I feel so low. There's nothing in my life, I grow older each day. Yet no one ever with me will stay. I want a life, but fear's holding me back. Dear diary, my tears made your blue cover black. Third entry, while well, I have made my choice. I have argued and listened to that inner voice. It's no use, this pain, I just can't go on. There is only rain when I needed the sun. Well, thanks for being there, I'm glad you understood. Dear diary, I am sorry for all of this blood. Fourth day, I am slower now, my writing's bad. Whoever reads this, please don't be mad. I tried and I tried to make my life real, but it's over now, and good's how I feel. So please read this and smile for me and know I'm at peace. Dear diary, I am sorry. My entries now cease. And that's written because I've been there, to be honest. I've been in a place where I was so low and so down and so out that I did think of um, taking my own life. It did seem the only way out. Obviously, I'm glad I didn't now. A lot have happened since, but some people don't get to be so lucky. They don't find that thing that will lift them up from being at the depths of despair. I, like I said, I've been there, and when you turn and everything is dark and low, and even the sun seems to have a black sheen over it and it seems to be hidden, you know, then, yeah, the diary is basically just saying, look, some people, to some people, despair is the end and that's it and uh, they're quite prepared to face the end and smile and go so yeah that's my poem and it's called the diary like i said i hope it didn't upset you too much okay folks it's game time how are you with anagrams how are you with anagrams hmm 
Coming up on the screen in a minute are 10 anagrams of things associated with the festive season. All you've got to do is figure out what they are. And you know the beauty is? I'll be posting the answers on tomorrow's vlog. So coming up, this is the first anagram. I'll leave it on for 10 seconds for you. So you can write it down if you want or you can pause it here. Here is the second anagram. Have you fun yet? Here is the third anagram. And remember, these are all to do with the festive season. Anything to do with it. Here is the fourth anagram. These will test your brains a bit. Some are easy, some not so. Fifth anagram time. We're halfway through. Let's move on with number six. Number seven. Only three more to go after this. How are you doing? Here's number eight. Number nine, the penultimate one. And finally, we have So there you go. Those are your um, 10 anagrams. I'll show them again now. All 10. So you can see them. Those are the anagrams. You've just got to solve them. And I'll reveal the answer in tomorrow's vlog. Thing is about me, I've been doing word puzzles and word games for a very, very, very long time. And I love anagrams. I love mixing words around, letters around. I like doing all sorts of stuff like that. So uh, I thought I'd involve you in one of my little Christmas games. Hope you enjoy playing it anyway. You probably figured out most of them. But you'll find out the answers tomorrow on my vlog. So enjoy racking your brains. Yeah, so the last word. Now, let me think. Hmm. No, I'm only joking. Uh, yeah, tomorrow. What will tomorrow bring? Well, it's Tuesday tomorrow. Um, a couple of good things happened today. Um, a very strange thing happened today, actually. We'd got a parcel and we boxed it all up last night because when I went on Amazon, I found out that something for the parcel had mysteriously disappeared and they weren't sure when it was going to be delivered. So we boxed up this parcel last night and got it all ready to go tomorrow. And what happened in the post? the thing came to go in the parcel today so we've got to put it in a separate envelope and send that separate because we're not unpacking this parcel we've literally wrapped it up taped it up papered it up the lot so that was the first thing the other good thing is i ordered something for my wife about four weeks ago and i did nothing for a while I, I got in touch with them yesterday just to say look it's been four weeks i still haven't received the parcel and it uh, turned up today didn't it turned up today so uh, that's good news i can uh, safely wrap the presents now without having to worry about something being missing but it's funny how when you're wrapping presents that you suddenly seem to think to yourself is that everything i ordered especially if you've ordered a fair few items you know because obviously we've we, we've done a lot of our shopping on amazon and we've ordered a lot of people's christmas presents off amazon so we have basically had a lot of things come in like big bulky loads like so we've had seven or eight items at once and we've literally had to go uh, we've ordered that, tick that off. We ordered that, tick that off. We ordered that, tick that off. Because it can be very confusing doing uh, Christmas shopping. I mean, if you're an adult, you know what I'm on about. If you've got kids, it's probably even worse. The one thing I am glad of is um, I don't have to buy for many littlies. Uh, because my youngest nephew now is 11, 
12, 11, 12, one of them. And um, my oldest nephew is 33. So <laughs> there's a bit of a scope between them, but there's no three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, none, none of the little ditties. So, you know, you don't have to go scouring toy shops looking for stuff. Um, they all want different things nowadays. Um, so, yeah, it's just... It's still bizarre doing Christmas shopping, um, knowing that my mum ain't here. I must admit, it's still very strange, not looking for stuff for her and not having to look for people's wish lists and buy her something that somebody, you know, oh, can you get me this for such and such? Yeah, can you get me this for such and such? And I used to have calls off me uh, nephew saying, can you get some of Nan's wish list for me? And I was always doing that for people, and now it's just all stopped. So, yeah, on that note, I'm going to love you and leave you. And remember, today in the Harry Potter calendar, it was Filch and Mrs. Norris. And in The Nightmare Before Christmas, it was the very creepy-looking Dr. Finkelstein. It's day 15 tomorrow, and then there's only 10 days to go. We're on a countdown after that, aren't we? You all take care. I'll do another vlog tomorrow. Bye for now.